Coming up, servicing your car, getting it right, and why this really, really matters. Pro tip, it's not why you think. I'm Johnny Logan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap! <laughs> for it! Australia only website. Card. Now, I've got the common question about servicing. I always get it. It comes from dudes and dudettes who do not drive very far every year, all up in arms about having to get their car serviced so damn often, meaning once every 12 months. Remember the bad old days where it was once every 12 weeks? Well, I'm certainly glad they don't make them like they used to. Anyway... I've got a cautionary tale for you about what can go wrong if you don't abide by the rules here because you will go properly under the bus and there's SFA that you can do about it, at least in as far as I can tell. This report is sponsored by NordVPN. Now, I'm not a hardcore IT guy, but I've heard enough, especially recently, about data breaches, scams and hacks to know that being online can be inherently risky and costly. You don't have to be tech savvy to use NordVPN. It's a simple one-stop cyber security solution. One click and you are protected from hackers, malware and pop-ups across as many as six devices. NordVPN is the world's fastest VPN. I don't even notice it running in the background, frankly. And it only costs about as much as a cup of coffee to keep your data, your identity and your devices secure every month. NordVPN can also save you money because you can assign your virtual location to another country where, for example, flights and accommodation might be cheaper than they are back at home. The same goes for streaming services and you can access live sporting events and other content that may not be available where you actually live. It's a pretty small price to pay for cyber security. Not to mention the potential savings also on the table. Go to nordvpn.com slash AEJC to get a huge discount off your plan plus four months free. Totally risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash AEJC. Link in the description. And thanks to Nord for sponsoring this episode. I did this video on metal fabrication earlier in the week and I got a heap of questions about this thing because I whipped it out and used it. And the questions were like, WTF, dude? What is that? What does it do? This is called a Mega Square. It's from a company named Fireball Tool in America. The owner there, Jason, has a really, really cool YouTube channel where he makes all kinds of zany stuff. He's got really good build videos and technique videos. He does testing and all of that sort of stuff. And it's, you know, easy to knock back half a bottle of Shiraz watching Jason at Fireball Tool. If you want another one like that, Cutting Edge Engineering, Shreya, Curtis at Cutting Edge Engineering, in Queensland is the Jedi master of shrink fitting dirty big bearings with liquid nitrogen into very precise line board holes and that is freaking poetry in motion dude so if you're looking for something to watch fireball tool cutting edge engineering Australia two thumbs up both times that's four thumbs but I'm limited in that respect I think we all are so anyway these come in two sizes this is huge as Donald Trump would say and this one is merely you know, big, but they're really strong and they're different to these carpentry framing squares with which you might be somewhat more familiar. This is like a, a clean, a queen, could be a queen square, but it's actually a clean square for like marking out. It's pretty good at that, but it's lousy for fixturing. And the salient difference between wood and metal is that wood moves once you've built it, you know. Tables always swell up and shrink with the humidity, as do floors and drawers and cabinets and chairs and everything that you build out of wood goes... and the humidity changes, right? And uh, metal is different because it doesn't do that. It shrinks when you weld it, and that is such a bastard. So when you watch welding, you're always watching sparks and the drama and all of that, and the welder's always just not thinking about that. He's thinking about, well, how do I stop this bending out of shape completely? And this is one of those ways. It's a fixturing square. So if you've got two things that you want to weld together, you usually use this lying down like this, and then you've got a third flat surface, right? But we'll just do it sitting up like this so you can see. 
you put these two things together, you put a couple of clamps across here and then you weld and when the weld shrinks, it gets held in place and it doesn't spring all over the place. Because if I just stick this on the table and weld this here, it's going to shrink like that. And if I do that to all four corners, I'm not going to be able to fit something together that is square enough to get the job done. You should never aim for perfection, of course. You just need to aim for good enough. Is it square enough, flat enough, straight enough, smooth enough? Enough is good enough, but if you don't use a fixturing square, it's very unlikely that the thing that you build will be square enough. There are other hedges as well, like tacking in the right order and welding things out in the right order, but these babies make things easy. They are fantastic, and they're, they're not cheap, but they are lifetime purchases, and they're really fun to use because they've been very well designed, really thought out well by a dude who started welding and became one of the most practical engineers I can imagine. I've got this first question here from a dude named Dennis Russell. I feel oddly naked, just bear with me. Mightier than the sword. I don't mind sitting here with no trousers on, but without a pen, I just feel exposed. Don't ask me why. Dennis goes, I'm 76 years old and I drive a 2017 Hyundai SR Premium. I think he means an i30 SR Premium. Damn good car when it was launched. It has recently undergone its 50,000k service. However, it only has 35,000k's on the clock. My question is, should I continue my services as per the annual requirements where I foresee my 60,000k service with approximately 40,000k's on the clock or should I go by the actual kilometres travelled? You should go by the time, dude. If you don't drive very much, go by the time. If you drive big distances, go by the distance. That's what you should do. That's definitive. Don't do it any other way. Do not say, I will wait for 60,000 Ks. That is just ushering in the four horsemen of the automotive apocalypse. Nobody wants that, okay? I bought this car after watching your video test drive. Thank you, Dennis. And I'm glad I did. Hope you can help. Many thanks, Dennis Russell. See, this is the thing about people who use their own names. They're polite. 76-year-old. He punctuates properly. He went, it's old school. Literally old school. Approved. Dennis, we're about to do what we can to help you, dude. But you should absolutely go on the time. That car had 10,000 kilometre 12 month service interval. It's still got that interval. You should get it serviced every 12 months because you don't drive 10,000 k's a year. Pro tip, servicing is time or distance, whichever comes first. Whichever comes first, so important. Because what low K drivers do is they go, I'm not at the k's yet, I might wait until I get to the 10,000. You know, if you only drive 5,000 k's a year, that means the oil is going to be in your engine for two years. And that's cruel and unusual, punishment-wise, for an internal combustion engine. Oil's got a shelf life. It degrades once it's been subjected to the turning and burning process. There are acids and oxides and contaminants and water and unburnt fuel, and it's all working against the brilliant chemical engineering of oil. The real magic there is that when oil gets really thin, like I'm talking get oil on your fingers, press it down really tight like that, you can't feel it but the film is really tough. It keeps those precisely machined metal parts apart. Because when metal rubs on metal, that's bad. But when you get a film of oil in there, it's only a few microns thick, it'll go all day long and then some. And that is the real brilliance of lubrication, right? It, it really is. In things like engines and gearboxes and all other mechanical components that get lubricated, oil is just underrated in terms of how brilliant it actually is and what it does to extend service life, but there are limits, okay? So you should change it every 12 months, at least. If you don't drive very far, it might even be worthwhile getting an oil change done every six months. Not going to hurt. A bit like chicken soup when you've got a cold or something, isn't it? So anyway, I've got this other tale here from Brendan McGonigal. And he's in a bit of a bind. And I really feel for Brendo because nobody does this kind of thing intentionally. And the reason I'm using two Hyundai examples here is that there is a bit of a groundswell about engine failures out there on Facebook, on the socials and, you know, in the community generally. And there are advocacy groups getting into this and class action investigations even happening about premature engine failures with Hyundais. But 
I see smoke, but I don't see any fire. Because when you look at the smoke on a case-by-case -case basis, there's often a really good reason why these people didn't get looked after. And Brendo's tale is one of those really good reasons, sadly. And this is costing tens of thousands of dollars to fix, I'm sure, which is a big hit, especially in the current climate with interest rate pressures and inflation and things of that nature. So I'm not going to have a big shot at Brendo. He's done the wrong thing. He's made some choices that have bitten him on the ass. But we'll go through the story and I'll put the table up on the screen as well so you can confirm the numbers with me. Uh, incidentally, the information here, the, the one from Dennis and the one from Brendan, they know I'm a journalist. They sent me this information. They didn't ask for confidentiality. And P.S., if you send something to a journalist, you should see it in print. You should expect to see it in print potentially anyway. And if you don't want to see it in print, you should ask for confidentiality and you should get a response that says, yeah, I'll make that confidential before you give the information across, if that's what you want. Uh, that's just something you should do whenever you approach the press. There's no guarantee of confidentiality unless there's a contract that's been entered into, is what I'm saying. Okay, so anyway, Brendan didn't ask for that, and I think there's significant value in the public domain uh, just explaining what happened. So here's Brendan's message. He said, Hi, John, I've read the advice below that you recently provided to a Hyundai owner regarding engine problems with Hyundai vehicles. Your advice seems well-reasoned. This is the bad bit. The timing chain on our 2016 Santa Fe Highlander broke late last year, just out of warranty, and caused damage that required a complete engine rebuild. I have limited mechanical knowledge, so would appreciate an independent opinion from someone such as yourself as to what extent the service history for the vehicle is likely to have been a contributing factor. Now, it was purchased in June of 2016. The engine failure was in December of 2021, so that's like five and a half years later. It's just out of warranty. And Brendan provided me with the data that he supplied on the vehicle's service history. And I've not approached Hyundai about this. I'm not going to. This seems like pretty matter-of-fact stuff. And what I note here is that Brendo's a pretty high-K driver, right? He's done 129,000 Ks in, let's call it, six years. That's a fair number of Ks, I'd have to say. But their service interval in Ks, it's a 15,000 service interval in this car, or 12 months, right? And there's only one of those services in which he's complied with that limit. He's got one service done at 13,400. He's had three of them done at 15 and a bit, and the rest of them have been almost 22,000 and almost 23,000. So he's got one in the high, he's got two in the high 21s and one in the high 22s, which is 50% over what the manufacturer says. And I'm inferring from Brendo's communication here that. He approached them for some sort of resolution, like give me some charity, help me out, goodwill, whatever you want to call it. And they went, well, based on the service history, no can do, bro. And I'd have to say I come down on their side over this. I know I come down generally as a sort of hardcore consumer advocate, but the stories you don't hear about that I don't tell are the ones where the consumer's just a card-carrying nut. They get it badly wrong. And this is a case, I'm not alleging that Brendo's been malicious here. He's done this intentionally. I think this is just unwitting. And I note that some of the timing here corresponds to COVID. And that could have been a problem getting the servicing done. But for whatever reason, three of those services are massively over. And three of them are technically over. And only one of them complies. And what happens here? If you have any kind of engine failure, like a catastrophic failure, the first thing every car manufacturer in the nation is going to do when assessing whether or not to give you goodwill, meaning a freebie, is they're going to look at the service history. And if the service history is crap, and objectively that's what this service history is, then they're just not going to help you. And it doesn't matter what the brand is, that's going to be what happens. Some car makers are particularly vigilant when it comes to this stuff. They look for technical breaches of the service history and they say, well, you've made one breach just here. You were 500 k's over or something. We're not going to help you. And that is an example of a car maker being an abject bastard about it and just profiteering. But when you've got three services that were essentially in the ballpark of 50% over, 
you just have to say enough's enough. And you have to acknowledge that servicing is a contract that you enter into. And it's not just cars, right? If you buy one of those dirty big bulldozers that Curtis works on, cutting edge engineering, and you don't service it according to the number of hours of operation, then you're toast if something fails. There won't be a warranty aspect to your failure. It's just on you, dude. Like servicing is down to you. It's an obligation. And I'd suggest there are two things. If you're a low mileage driver, then... Things like tyres and brakes and dampers and things that wear out more or less everything else being equal in proportion to the distance you drive, they're going to take a while to wear out because you don't drive much. But it's actually a very severe sort of operating condition for vehicles if you don't drive much because the engine doesn't spend very much time as a proportion of its overall operational time at its proper operating temperature. And what that means is the oil is going to be full of contaminants like water and unburnt fuel because the clearances in the parts, specifically in the pistons and rings and the bores of the engine, they're going to be suboptimal. They're going to be a bit loose. And that means for the first few minute that the, minutes that the engine runs, contamination is going to be in the crankcase. It's going to mix with the oil. It's going to degrade the oil faster than it would if you drive long distances all the time. Now, obviously, Brendo here is a long-distance driver. He does a lot of Ks in a relatively short period of time. Like in five years, the average car does 75 or 80,000 Ks. Brendo's done 129,000, so he's 50% higher than average kind of thing. And that means that he has to get his car serviced on a kilometre basis, right? 15,000 Ks, get it serviced. Like... It's not rocket science. There's a service indicator in the info display in the center of the dash, and it says, get your car service, dude. That's not like a naked grab for cash. Now, what I suggest here is that the timing chain failure is like this. Most engines are what they call interference engines, which means that there's a precise choreography of the motion of the pistons and the valves, and... It's only by virtue of the timing of that choreography that the pistons don't hit the valves because when the valves are fully open, they are lower in the uh, bore than the piston is when it reaches top dead centre. So the only thing keeping them apart, if you like, is the precise choreography of the operation, which is defined by the timing chain. When the timing chain fails... The valves, these things happen very quickly. The engine's moving fast and the valves can be like this and the piston comes up and slams into the valves and then that's just a catastrophic failure which is really hard to come back from with the same engine. And manufacturers will just say, we need to replace the engine. It may be possible to rebuild the engine depending on how much damage was caused by that failure, right? So if you have to pay for the repair, then maybe that's something to look at. An independent repairer might do it cheaper. But I'd suggest that in either case, you really need to comply with the time or the distance. And then you are likely to get looked after because there's no excuse for the engine failing prematurely. But what happens now, at least as I see it legally, is that Brendo sort of is in this position where nobody knows if the degradation of the oil caused the premature failure of the timing chain. But the manufacturer is going to say, well, you didn't get your car serviced on time and you've breached the servicing arrangements six times and three of them by three of them by a massive margin. It's not funny. And we can't look after you for this reason because otherwise we just open the door and we have to look after everybody who is approaching us with some sort of unjustifiable claim, right? There has to be a limit, and this is over that line. So for Brendan to get a claim up successfully, what he would have to do is do proper expert engineering, like commission, proper expert engineering forensic investigation into the failure mechanism of the chain. And that's a real roll of the dice because it'd be costly and it might be inconclusive. But the onus is on the owner of the car in circumstances like these to prove that there was a manufacturing defect that caused the failure. And I guess if the planets align and you can do that, then you might get a claim up. But 
it's a roll of the dice. It involves greater expenditure than Brando's already forked out. And this could have all been avoided. Now, doubtless there were reasons that seemed okay at the time for not meeting the servicing obligations. But I'd suggest this is like playing Russian roulette. And Russian roulette's fine as long as the hammer never comes down on a loaded chamber. And that's exactly what has happened here. The hammer has come down and there's a mess to clean up in aisle three. I just think that what's going to happen here is that Brendo's going to wear the cost and it could have been so easily avoided. And what I sincerely hope as a result of highlighting this whole sorry tale is that you might recalibrate the consequences to you of justifying in the moment the fact that you are three months over or 5,000 Ks over on the servicing of your car. Or you might just think, that doesn't matter. I'll put it in the background and deal with it later, some other time, which never comes. And if you want a $20,000 bill or whatever it is, 25, 30, if you can afford that sort of bill and it doesn't really matter to you, then great. And if it does matter to you, I'd suggest the three, four, five hundred dollars, whatever it is, to get that particular service done right now is chump change to get that done on time in comparison to the risk of what can happen. So just look at it like insurance, dude. And remember, time or the distance, whichever comes first, it's going to be the time if you don't drive very far, you know, annually. And it's going to be the distance if you're on the highway all the time getting shit done. That's just how this works.